Hello, everyone, and welcome to the monthly NASW Pennsylvania Chapter webinar. My name is Rachel Rhodes, and I'm the Membership and Communication Strategist. This free webinar series is done as a member benefit and is available to members only. Webinars are done each month at the last Wednesday of the month at 12 and count for one CE credit. During the webinar, if you have questions, type them into the questions section on the menu on the side. To obtain your CE credit, you must attend a minimum of 50 minutes of this webinar. After the webinar, if you attend that minimum of 50 minutes, you will receive an email with a link to complete the evaluation. The link will also be posted in the chat section near the close of the webinar. The certificate will be sent to you via email within a few days. Note that the certificates are not automatically generated and will be sent by one of our staff members. Please allow at least a couple of business days before you contact us to say that you haven't received it already. And now I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Becky Suglia. Rebecca Suglia is a licensed clinical social worker in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. With a master's degree in social work from Temple University, she is a co-owner of a holistic health business focused on creating solutions for people that incorporate health, healing the body, mind, and, sp and spirit together. She counsels children, adolescents, adults, individuals, families, and groups, and specializes in, in treating grief and trauma. In addition, she also works part-time as a clinical therapist for Concerned Behavioral Health Services. She's, she served this organization by presenting at the state conference both as a solo presenter and in collaboration with a few colleagues annually since 2013. Additionally, she is certified as an Act 31 instructor serving the organization throughout the Commonwealth as a volunteer. In addition, she served on the conference committee since 2016. She's also the secretary of NASW PA Board of Directors. Thank you for being here today. Can I talk? Hello. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Rachel. Hello, everybody. All right, it looks like we have most of the people in here. Um, hopefully you all can see. Rachel, can you see both me and the PowerPoint? Yes, yeah, you're good. Okay, is there anything else? Do I need to close this thing or is it okay? You're fine. Okay, awesome. Hello, everybody. I am presenting to you actually from my ritual space, which I thought would be interesting. Behind me, besides the giant glare behind my head, is actually my altar and my husband's altar, because I wanted to give you guys an idea of what it looks like. I just wanted to welcome you all to Out of the Broom Closet. And we're gonna move because I know that you guys don't have a lot of time. So, oop, and we lost me. There we go. Um, as Rachel said, my name is Rebecca Solia. Um, and this is my presentation. And this is my little dream. I wanted to present this to people all over the country. So you guys get to be part of that. Um, you've read the abstract already um, because it was sent out. But actually, I'm going to tell you that this abstract is kind of a little bit of lie. And the reason I say that is because this is from the 2014 Pew Research Center Religious Landscape Survey. And obviously, it is 2019 now. So we have, we obviously, there's more people that could be accounted for than by a study that came out in 2014. The other thing is, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, people often don't identify these minority faiths for actually the very reasons why we're having this workshop today. So there we go. So the first thing I want to talk about is defining faith. And, and I don't know if any of you, if we were doing this in an actual classroom, I'd ask you to raise your hand and tell me if you've ever met anybody before that was pagan or heathen or a witch. If you've ever heard anyone use the term earth spiritual or any of those terms before. And before we begin, I'd like you to here to listen to those words and think about what they mean to you. Think about what those words mean in your life experiences, okay? 
you may know exactly what those words mean because you might be one of my friends or you might be somebody who's been in a circle with me somewhere or you might not have any idea what those words mean. The images I'm going to show you are just a few of how people of our minority faiths are often portrayed in the media. And I'm betting that you have seen some of these images before. So let me show you some of them. One of our seasonal favorites there. One of my personal favorites there. <laughs> Okay, so you should all be able to recognize that these images I showed you are fiction, right? So, hold on. Uh, sadly, the ideas that are perpetuated by these images, not just these images, but the ideas perpetuated in our society about who pagans, witches, and other earth spiritual people this has continued for generations. And as we continue today, I'm gonna to tell you stories that have been in the news. I'm gonna tell you stories that have happened to me. I'm gonna tell you stories that have happened to my clients and to my friends. And I want you to understand that this is our real lived experience. So I gotta ask the question, who are these people for real, who are witches and who are pagans and who are people who practice earth spiritual religions? So I'm gonna give you some definitions. Yay, definitions. Now, when you receive your packet of information about this workshop, we, I have also included the definitions on a single page. So you will also receive a copy of the definitions. Um, but the first we're going to begin with is pagan, because I say that word pretty frequently, and the word paganism. And it comes from the Latin word pagani, which meant civilian or country or rustic. It was just somebody who didn't live in the city. As people were converting from folk religions to Christianity, pagan became the word for anybody who wasn't Christian. That seems simple, right? Over time, go away, you. Over time, pagan has been, hey, go away, sorry, technical difficulties. Over time, pagan has been used to mean primitive, savage, immoral, evil. Now the word pagan often is used to describe someone who follows an old path, one of the folk religions that existed before Christianity. And now some people also use the word neo-pagan interchangeably. And that defines somebody who follows a modern version of one of the old religions. But frankly, the majority of the people that I know that are pagan use the word pagan rather than neo-pagan. Um, Wicca is actually a new religion with its spiritual roots in folk traditions. It was introduced to the world in the mid 50s um, by the man that we call the father of modern witchcraft, Gerald Gardner. Um, in England, they repealed their witchcraft laws in the 50s. So shortly after he repealed, after they repealed those laws, he published Witchcraft Today. That was 1954. It says he organized his first coven, but people believe that probably Gerald had covens going before then. They were just kind of in the broom closet, which is what we call when we are in hiding, when we don't want anybody to know that we are witches or pagans or whatever. Um, anyway, he organized his coven with the help of his friend Doreen Valiente, 
Um, he defined modern witchcraft as we know it today. The word Wicca means to change or to bend, and those who practice the art, the craft, the science of Wicca focus on changing their world through mundane and through magical acts. And we're going to talk a little bit about magic as we go on. You just give me a little bit of time. Um, which, my favorite word, this word often has a negative connotation, um, but we have been reclaiming it. Uh, it's been reclaimed by followers of pagan religions worldwide. Some witches practice Wicca. Others define themselves as practitioners of paganism, druidry, heathenism, and other traditions. Some others follow an eclectic path, choosing bits and pieces of lots of different paths and deities from multiple pantheons, and witches are both male and female. That's an important thing to remember. I have witches that are male and female and non-binary and trans, and witches are all over the gender spectrum. We're just witches. A coven is a group of witches. It's a hierarchical group of witches who gather together to worship, to study their faith, to celebrate seasonal holidays together. Frankly, because if you're gonna celebrate holidays, it's a lot more fun to do it in groups. Typically, a coven doesn't have any more than 13 members. Just because too large a group gets too cumbersome to manage, the leaders of a coven are often called high priest and or high priestess. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's both, sometimes there's none at all. Um, a warlock. For most people following these paths, warlock is a bad word. Yes, you will hear warlock in horror movies and in, you know, movies and things that you see on TV. But frankly, a male witch or Wiccan is simply called a witch or Wiccan. Warlock is derived from a Scottish word which means oathbreaker, and most of us really don't want to be called an oathbreaker, which seems kind of logical. A heathen. Sometimes heathens are also referred to as a satru. Heathen has often been used to describe somebody who doesn't have morals or a spiritual compass, but in reality, a heathen is someone who follows the Nordic or Germanic paths. When meeting a heathen, you'll find they're very dedicated to family and honor and specifically the nine noble virtues. That's kind of their, their ethical compass there. And their nine noble virtues are courage, truth, honor, fidelity, discipline, hospitality, industriousness, self-reliance, and perseverance. And Druid, and, and I identify, by the way, as a pagan, as a witch, and sometimes I refer to myself as a Druid. Druid refers to an ancient religion, religion my, sorry, my brain isn't working, most often recognized as practiced by the Celtish, Celtic people of the British Isles and Western Europe. Druids were the shamans of the Celtic culture. They were healers and ritualists, spiritual counselors. If we looked at the roles played by Druids in the past, you'll see them as lawyers, philosophers, scientists, professors, and priests all in one. Modern Druids often worship the gods and goddesses of the Celtic lands and are especially dedicated to their relationship with nature. Okay, so who are pagans? Who are we? It's difficult to define, first of all, how many people identify as pagan, Wiccan, or other earth spiritual religion. And the reason for this is because many people remain in the broom closet keeping their faith a secret because of fears of discrimination, stigma, or even violence. In addition, many studies and forums on religious beliefs don't include pagan religions as a choice, lumping them all together as other. The United States Census does not ask about religion. However, there are religious institutions and other third party statistical organizations which regularly survey Americans about religious affiliations. According to one survey, the Pew Forum on Religion, and you can see the information about that on your screens, um, according to the Pew Forum, as of 2014, there were 956,000 people or 3% of the US population that identified themselves as pagan, Wiccan, or other earth spiritual faith that were estimated to be living in the United States. This number 
is probably inaccurate. I'm just gonna say that over and over again. Um, it's most likely a low estimate because of our above mentioned fears, as well as the fact that now, of course, that study is a couple years old. And I mentioned that in the beginning. Other studies suggest the number is a lot higher. More recently, there's been a 2017 survey from Pew Research Center that examined new age beliefs. 60% of Americans believe in one or more of the following, psychics, astrology, the presence of spiritual energy in inanimate objects like mountains or trees, or reincarnation. More than a quarter of adults in the United States say they think of themselves as spiritual, but not religious. To add some numbers here, according to an executive with Barnes & Noble, the American pagan buying audience, and that's exactly how they described it, reached 10 million people. Another source, there's a website, religioustolerance.org, cites that there are 750,000 people in the United States that identify as Wiccan, specifically as Wiccan. That's a lot of people. Paganism, and specifically Wicca, have been recognized as a bona fide religion by several state and federal courts, as well as by U.S. military courts. A number of court cases have been decided, which recognize these minority religions are worthy of First Amendment rights. Indeed, paganism has been listed in the U.S. Military Chaplain's Handbook since 1980. Um, you can check that out online. It's actually available to look at the, the Handbook for Chaplains online, which is kind of a cool thing. Okay, so there's so much more than fits on this diagram. Let me just tell you that. Um, because I want you to understand kind of where paganism fits in the big picture. So there's the big three, the Abrahamic religions. You can see Judaism and Christianity and Islam. And there's a whole lot that fits in that Abrahamic religions that isn't there. Like I said, this is ridiculously simplistic. And then our pagan religions, I have here Wicca, witchcraft, heathenry, brujeria, people who just call themselves pagans. Eastern religions kind of sort of fit in there, but don't. Native American spirituality is completely outside of that Venn diagram. Buddhism is completely outside of that diagram. And some religions are connected to both of the Abrahamic religions and pagan paths. So examples like Santeria, um, some people uh, practice voodoo or voodoo. I, it's pronounced differently by different groups. Satanism is actually connected to Abrahamic religions more than it's connected to pagan religions, which is kind of wild. Okay, so a lot of people might ask the question, why is this important? And to tell you why this is important, I have to tell you a little bit about me, okay? So as you might have guessed, I am a social worker. Gee, you might not have known that. And I'm a witch. Before I decided to become a social worker and a counselor, I have a daughter, um, I, I apologize. I have a non-binary child, um, but my child is 24 years old now. And when they were 10 years old, they needed to go to a counselor. They were experiencing bullying at school and they had some anger issues related to that and they needed to go to a counselor. And I did all the things that you do as a mom. I contacted my company's EAP. I got the phone number of a counselor and I stopped and I took a big deep breath because I was really, really scared sending my child to a counselor, knowing that in doing so, I was exposing my family to the, <laughs> the ridicule, to even the danger of having the counselor call CYS on me, because our path is not understood by most of the people in America. And at the time, I lived in a relatively small community, and I was kind of, as we call it, in the broom closet. I not everybody knew about my religion. So I was afraid that if I took my child to a counselor, the counselor was gonna call CYS on me, that somebody was gonna to threaten to take my child away from me. 
that my child would experience the same ridicule that I was worried about as well. That's a scary thing. It's a scary thing, I think, for all of us to worry about. And as ridiculous as it sounds, it happens in this country, in this day and age. It happens all the time. As we continue, I do have stories to share from other people that have the same and similar spiritual practices as mine. And I've asked them all to share their stories with me and they've trusted me with them and allowed me to share them with you. Um, I was lucky and I was really blessed that our counselor, her name's Jackie, um, she understood everything. I carry that woman's business card in my purse to this day. I don't even know if she's still a counselor anymore, but I was lucky and blessed that she understood it, that she was wonderful. She understood paganism. She got who we were. Um, but in that moment, I decided that I never wanted another parent to go through this. When the opportunity arose for me to become a social worker and to engage in the art of therapy, I made it my life's purpose to serve the families that were different, to serve families that were pagan and Wiccan and earth spiritual. And I also serve families on the LGBT you know, spectrum and I serve poly families and I serve all the families that fit outside the norm because I didn't want them to feel that same fear that I felt. Um, it's, it's my personal mission to do this. In that moment, becoming a social worker and a counselor, it all became part of my mission. I can be a social worker and a counselor. I can serve families, including a small number of families in Berks County, or I can teach a whole class of social workers about our faith, and I can help individuals and families all across the Commonwealth. I hope and I pray as we begin this today that all of you who are listening keep an open mind and an open heart, that you listen and you learn. You understand who we are, accept who we are, and treat us with the dignity, respect, and positive regard that's our mandate as social workers. Um, moving on. Oh. Now you know my story. What are you going to do? Ah, ethics. And you know what? My ethics one just disappeared, but I'll tell you about ethics. Um, if you ask most Wiccans, pagans, and, and witches, they'll tell you their number one rule is harm none. By stating this, they mean that any act taken, either magical or mundane, must cause no harm. That includes to the practitioner. That includes to me. Um, every person interprets this rule differently. So for some, it means that they stop to think about the consequences of their actions before doing them. Isn't that a good idea for everybody to do, to stop and think about what the consequences of your actions are gonna be before you do them? For others, it means ecological consciousness, like working in human rights, working for the protection of animals, or even eating a vegan diet, um, because that choice causes the least harm. The most important part of this to understand is that it's not just what you do in ritual, it's what we do in life that we have to look at and say, is this causing harm? Because pagans see the earth as sacred and a representation of deity, then every single step we take upon the earth is sacred and everything we do in our lifetime has to be done with some kind of reverence, if that makes sense to you. Um, the threefold law is something that we discuss. The threefold law means whatever you send out into the world comes back to you. Some people believe that it comes back three times, hence the name. Others believe that it comes back many times. Personally, I believe that what we send out into the world comes back until we have learned whatever we need to learn from that lesson. The good thing about the threefold law when we talk about what we send out into the world is that it's not just the bad stuff we send out into the world. If I send love out into the world, then love is what comes back to me. If I send healing out into the world, then healing is what comes back to me. Um, and I think, you know, I hear people talk about that, you know, what you send out, you come back in circles outside of paganism, which I think is interesting. Um, we talked a little earlier about the nine noble virtues. So heathens who follow Nordic or Germanic paths abide by this nine noble virtues, which is described as an ancient Germanic moral code. And anything that I'm talking about that you guys want to look up, you can look it up later. Um, 
because we have literally an hour and I've got to squish a whole lot of information into an hour. Um, but anyway, um, the, the nine noble virtues come from multiple sources, including the poetic Edda, the Havamal, come from the Icelandic sagas and other works of folklore. And once again, these virtues are interpreted differently by every individual person, every clan, which is a family or a small group, by each kindred, which is a large group of heathens that gather together for celebrations. The virtues began as custom and tradition, but are often considered by heathens to be their spiritual laws that they must follow. Um, they are the most highly regarded ethical basis of their ancient religion. Before a heathen considers approaching the gods and goddesses for help with something, they must know the virtues and be abiding by them in their daily life. So it's kind of a big deal. Um, and what do we believe? First and foremost, there's no central text, so there's no Bible of sorts in paganism or Wicca or witchcraft. There just isn't. We have lots and lots of folkloric tales depending on which pantheon you're connected to. Um, there is, there's no central deity either. Pagans worship many different deities. Um, sometimes, hold on, sometimes we choose deities that connect to our ancestries. Sometimes we choose deities that connect to where we live in the world. Sometimes we just choose the deities that are kind of calling us in our heart. Um, there's no organized hierarchy. So there are smaller groups like covens and groves and kindreds, and there are leaders just kind of to keep things organized. Even if we have a study group, and I've been a part of several study groups, we will sometimes choose somebody to be the leader just for that particular thing that we're doing, just so we don't have everybody trying to talk at once but ritual is often shared among members. There are some bigger organizations organized to help individuals and groups gain access to resources. So there's an organization called Covenant of the Goddess. They're a 501c3 nonprofit faith-based organization, and they actually help provide resources to pagans and Wiccans and witches all over the world. There is a list of resources that's also being sent to you guys, and you can find information on Covenant of the Goddess and a whole bunch of other resources if you're interested. Um, but many witches, Wiccans, pagans, and heathens, we practice alone. Um, we choose our deities, gods, and goddesses from many different pantheons, like Greek, Egyptian, Irish, Scottish, German, African, Chinese, Native American. There's mythologies from all over the world. And pagans connect to and worship gods and goddesses from everywhere. Some pick different deities for different pur purposes. It's entirely up to the individual. Because of this, some pagans have iconography from all over the world on their altars. And I'm going to quick flip to this so that you can see. I know you can see behind me, and I told you that we're in my ritual space. But if you look, let's see if I lean the right direction. That way, there's my husband's altar. And because he practices things that are close to Hinduism, sometimes he has Hindu gods and goddesses on his altar. And if you look the other way, ah, I'm leaning the wrong way. If you look the other way, you can see my altar. And I know it's hard to see because I'm a little far away from it. But I have an earth mother on my goddess, on my goddess. I have an earth mother goddess statue on my altar. And I've also got kind of a forest woodland god on my altar. And if you could see the rest of my room, you'd see, you know, that I have gods and goddesses here from all over the world. Because in my personal belief, all the gods and goddesses of the world are all connected by our common human experience. Um, anyway, we honor the earth. We honor each other. We honor all life on this planet. Because we're individuals, that might look different from person to person. Um, let me get back to this. The elements. So because we honor the earth and we see it as an extension of both ourselves and deity, we often honor the elements. Um, the elements are earth, air, fire, water. And each element represents a different part of us and our lives. 
For example, when I do ritual or when I pray, I use earth to represent safety, home, and grounding. Air is often used to describe inspiration and creativity. Fire often is passion, strength, and heart. And I use water for cleansing, purifying, and making things new again. Above and within these elements lies spirit. Our spirit, the spirit of the earth, the divine spirit that we talk to in prayer, in meditation, and in ritual. And let's talk about ritual. Let's get there. Come on, there we go. Holidays and ritual. So there are lots of reasons for ritual. Ritual is a time of prayer, meditation, and celebration. Some of the reasons we have ritual are our solar holidays, the wheel of the year. And because we have an hour and we've got a lot of stuff to figure in, I've actually sent the list of the holidays to you. Um, well, I've sent it to Rachel and Rachel's going to send it to you. But our holidays are solar holidays. So I'll just tell you the dates of them in bulk it is February 2nd or what you guys would call Groundhog Day. Um, Astara or Spring Equinox, you know what Spring Equinox is. Beltane is May 1st. And those first three are kind of planting holidays. Um, summer Solstice or Litha is usually June 21st, 22nd, because it's astrological. Um, Lamas or Lanasa is August 1st. Mabon or Autumn Equinox is usually September 21st or 22nd. Samhain, Samhain is tomorrow. Happy Samhain, everybody, is what you guys would call Halloween, but it is actually one of our most sacred holidays because we are celebrating the passing of our ancestors um, and preparing for wintertime. And finally, Yule or winter solstice, which is uh, December 21st, 22nd. Um, and I wish I had more time because I would tell you everything you need to know about every holiday, but unfortunately, we are short on time. Um, here are some photos of rituals that I wanna share with you. Um, so some examples in the corner, um, the upper left corner is a Beltane maple, and some of you may have seen a maple before. It is celebrating fertility, it is a phallic symbol that goes into the earth because, oh, did I lose you? Okay, then. Uh, we're celebrating the fertility of the earth and the fertility of us as human beings. Um, on the, let's see, I think this went clockwise. This was a Lamas altar to the right of it. Um, a Samhain altar you can see on the bottom right, and it has all kinds of goodies on it. It has wine, it has fruit, it has flowers, and it has a skull to represent our ancestors that have gone before us. And then there's another Samhain altar on the bottom corner. And then on this far right corner is actually one of my Yule altars. Oh my goodness, from I can't even tell you how many years ago. And Yule or winter solstice is about the return of the light. So we light candles just like everybody lights Christmas trees, um, which are a pagan celebration also. Um, but we light candles to bring back the light because Yule or winter solstice is the longest night of the year and the shortest day of the year. Okay, so talking about ritual a little bit, um, we wanna talk about our lunar holidays and we celebrate the full moon ritual and the new moon ritual. We often talk about the moon representing the goddess. For some people, the moon represents the goddess and the sun represents the god. What's interesting is, remember I said that we celebrate deities from all around the world. In some parts of the world, there are sun goddesses and moon gods as well. So paganism, witchcraft, Wicca, Heathenry, it's all your personal experience. Um, but full moon ritual is often used to celebrate the fullness of life. We fill ourselves up with energy, abundance, and joy. During the full moon, we experience the goddess as mother. Most of us experience the goddess as mother. During new moon rituals, we use that time to invite things into our lives, like new beginnings, new relationships, new jobs. 
because it's dark during the full moon, we sometimes use this time for banishing, for getting rid of things we don't want, habits we don't want to keep. We can't start new things unless we get rid of the old ones. Um, okay, moving forward. Okay, celebrations. There are so many reasons to celebrate. Just like in your everyday life, you celebrate lots of things. So do we. So the pictures that I have here are talking about some of our celebrations where it says wickening or baby blessing. That's actually me because I'm also a minister. Um, and I was doing a baby blessing for this beautiful baby who was being held in her grandma's arms. Uh, that was the lovely Layla and her daddy and her grandma. Um, the first moon or coming of age celebration. Uh, there are coming of age celebrations all over the world. And this is ours. We're celebrating uh, a young girl as she is becoming a maiden, as she is stepping into her menstruation and her beginning young womanhood. And dedications and initiations. Sometimes people do a dedication when they're choosing to dedicate themselves to a specific god or goddess. Sometimes dedication and initiation is when they're joining a group like a coven. Um, the image that's here was somebody's initiation into a coven. And as you can see, there's nothing particularly terrifying going on, just a, a blessing from the high priestess. Um, but we have other ceremonies. Um, we have hand fastings, and I so love hand fastings, I decided to give you a page full of them. Um, and you're, you'll, you'll laugh that actually the far right corner photo where you just see the hands being fasted, that's actually my hand fasting. Um, but the rest of the ones on this page are my friends. The ones in the center is actually a hand fasting that I officiated. Um, they are as different as every other wedding you've ever attended. Um, other celebrations that we do are cord cuttings. A cord cutting is a way to say goodbye to like a relationship that ended. You could do a cord cutting uh, as part of your divorce. You could do a cord cutting as you're leaving a job that you hate. It's just a way to end your connection to something that you want to let go of. Um, there are memorial services, just like there are memorial services everywhere else, and that's a natural burial you're seeing. Um, and, and heathen Norse and Asatru sometimes have funeral boats. Um, there are actually stories in this country of Navy veterans who were heathens who were allowed to have um, funeral boats as part of their, their memorial service. Um, and it was attended, the one that I read about was actually attended by the Coast Guard to, to protect the, the family who was attending this memorial service. Um, in other types of ceremonies, this past year, my family celebrated a name change ritual for one of my adopted children. Um, he, he is a trans boy and he changed his name. So we had kind of like a, a, a blessing for him. We blessed him and honored the legal change of his name. Just because there are hundreds of reasons we celebrate in our regular life, there are reasons we celebrate in our religious life too. Pagans, heathens, witches, Wiccans, we celebrate the passage of time with rituals. Um, the altar is a consecrated space where rituals held. Um, it's also a place where we hold our tools and supplies. And there's a list of altar tools and supplies in front of you. If you're looking behind me, you can again see two different altars behind me. And they're two vastly different altars because my husband and I practice differently. Um, what's funny is that I've always joked that our gods and goddesses must be friends because they're right next to each other. Um, but we practice differently and sometimes we practice together because that's what marriage is. Um, Items that you might find on a pagan, Wiccan, earth spiritual person's altar include an altar cloth, just a decorative cloth, like a tablecloth, candles, a cauldron, an athame. An athame is a ritual knife that's never actually ever used to cut anything in real time. We use an athame sometimes to cut time, to cut space, to cut a hole in our sacred circle. 
um, but it's never used to cut anything real. Um, a bowline is also a knife. It is used to actually cut things like cutting herbs, cutting cord in a cord cutting ceremony, things like that. Um, we use cords. I've used cords in healing rituals. Um, you might find incense, sage, which we use for purification, salt, you also used for purification, divination tools like um, mirrors or tarot cards or tea leaves, um, rocks, shells, and natural items. There's actually both rocks and seashells on my altar behind us. Flowers, you might see a chalice, which we use for water or for wine or sometimes for other things like cider or milk. Um, you might see water, food on our altars, which we give as an offering. You might see a book of shadows. A book of shadows is our book in which we write rituals, we write prayers, we write things like that in our books. Um, photos or drawings, religious symbols, images of gods and goddesses, bells, chimes, figures, dolls, bubbles. My child uses bubbles when they're honoring the element of air. Um, jewelry and amulets, you might see a magic wand. You might see lighters or matches, charcoal, because we use it to burn incense. Um, you might see a broom. I've got a broom in my house um, that I used during a hand fasting ceremony. And usually books. We're usually surrounded by books in my house. Um, when I do this in the classroom, I bring altar tools with me so you can look at and touch them. But obviously, that doesn't work here. Um, I will be going through more pictures of altars, so you'll get to see other people's altars and what are on them. And where these pictures came from, our community was kind enough to send me pictures of their altars so that you could see them. Um, and here are just some examples that you can see on your screen right now. Different altars for different purposes. Um, I love this one picture in the corner. Somebody's cat decided to take up residence on their altar. Um, remember I talked about we have different celebrations. On the left, we have an altar set up for Memorial Day to honor our veterans. And on the right was one for the anniversary of 9-11. Um, my friend Jen sent that one to me. So some symbols. I think it's important to talk about symbols. The first symbol that you see right in front of you is the pentagram. It's also sometimes called the pentacle. The pentagram is just the star, the five pointed star, and the pentacle is the five pointed star in a big circle. And it represents the elements. It represents the elements of earth, air, fire, water, and spirit. If you happen to see a pentagram or a pentacle Upside down, everybody seems to think that that means that someone's a Satanist. It really doesn't. Sometimes it just means that it got reversed. Sometimes it's because they're looking at spirit as being within instead of spirit being above. So for most people, the points on the star are the different elements with the topmost point being spirit. So if you reverse that and you're saying that spirit is within, it makes sense. Um, some other symbols that you might see is the triple goddess symbol. Um, it's a representation of the goddess, and we talk about the goddess being part of the moon, and we use it to represent the maiden, the mother, and the crone. And while there are different representations of goddess in those different phases, as women, we also experience those different phases of life. Um, the maiden part of our life when we are just beginning our lives as a young woman and learning and, and growing new things and, and experiencing new things, the mother part of our lives, some of us become mothers physically, but often when even when we're not mothers, we're giving birth to new ideas and new creations in our lives. And then the crone part of our lives, when we are aging and we're tying things up and we're, we're experiencing things in that kind of ending parts of our lives. Um, there's also a triple God, um, but it's not as often recognized. Um, this symbol you he see here is the Molnir. If you 
see somebody wearing a Molnir, you might find that they're a heathen or an Asatru or a follower of the old ways of the Norse, Germanic, or even Celtic traditions, or you might find that they're a really big Marvel fan because Thor carries a Molnir. Um, but it represents Thor's hammer. And if you study Norse mythology, you'll understand more of that. Um, the tree of life, they have trees all over the place, but the tree of life symbolism is used all over the world by a lot of different cultures and spiritualities. One of the more common symbolisms of the tree is that the roots are reaching down to the underworld, to our ancestors, to our past, and that the branches are reaching up to the gods and goddesses or reaching up to our future. And that the trunk of the tree, the center of the tree is where we are now. That the center of the tree is earth. It's our current state. Um, in Norse mythology, the tree is important as Yggdrasil and it is the world tree, which connects the nine worlds. In the Eddas, which is that Norse mythology we talked about earlier, in the Eddas, the, uh, which is written in the 13th century, the Yggdrasil is written about as an enormous ash tree in the center of the cosmos, connecting us to our ancestors and to our gods. And in Norse mythology, Odin sacrificed himself by hanging on the world tree for nine nights to learn the secret of the runes. So that particular symbolism is really important to our Norse uh, siblings as well. The so green man, another really cool symbol. The green man is a pre-Christian entity. It's the spirit of nature personified as a man. Um, depictions of him date back before the Roman Empire and he's found all over the world. However, he's most frequently seen in relation to the Celts and the Druids. He's intended as a symbol of life and rebirth. His face is face as seen as young, old, even as a skull with greenery growing out of it becoming something new. It's about the changes that human beings are constantly going through and our connection to the earth. He's often found on gravestones in the stonework of old churches and cathedrals, perhaps as a note from the workers saying, we're still here, which is kind of cool. So do you believe in magic? Magic is not. So let, let's, let's go for what magic is and what magic isn't. Magic isn't stage tricks, it isn't levitating or sending inanimate objects to fight the Nazis, although we wish it was. Magic won't make your car work when it's dead, it won't make you lose 50 pounds while still eating all the donuts you want, um, it won't bring your third grade teacher back to life, it won't make people love you, it won't make your presentation on the budget any more interesting. Magic is knowing what you want to happen, visualizing the result clearly in your mind as clearly as possible and then creating energy to make it happen an idea without energy is just a fairy tale we need to put energy into magic to make it happen so we create energy by dancing singing chanting walking lighting candles tying knots even sex creates energy other than magical energy, we need to put mundane or non-spiritual energy into our workings as well. For example, if you really want a job working at a certain company and you visualize yourself working there, create energy and send it to that image and really focus on it. It does you no good if you don't actually apply for the job, update your resume or dress appropriately for the interview. Um, does any of it sound familiar? It, it almost seems like magic is something we do all the time, not just something that we personally do in ritual. We do magic all the time. Um, I tell clients all the time, I tell all the people in my life that I have a magic wand, but it doesn't work that way. And what I mean is that we use a lot of tools to help us focus on our magic, as you saw in the pictures of the altars. Um, but the truth is that the magic isn't in the tools. If you took a magic wand away from uh, a witch or a pagan, you wouldn't be able to do magic. You wouldn't be able to harm them with it. And if you took their magic wand away, you you could still they could still do the magic. The magic is in you, and it's the energy that you put into what you want. It's not in the magic wand. Um, 
So unique abilities, and we're gonna do a real short version of this because we're running out of time. Um, some people believe that there's more to our universe. They believe in ghosts and spirits. Some people believe in our ability to see or hear or talk to ghosts and spirits. Um, it's entirely up to you what you choose to believe in. I ask that if you're working with a client and they tell you that their dead grandmother is seeing them, please don't, you know, um, send them to be committed because a lot of us uh, pagans, with witches, earth spiritual people believe that our ancestors are guiding us and they're with us all the time. Um, I want to go to the real people, the real cost of being out of the broom closet, because this is a really important part of this. Throughout the presentation, I've shared photos with you of real people and their lives. The photos and stories contained within are all used with permission from witches, pagans, heathens, and other earth spiritual people. They wanted you to see them and to hear their stories, to know them as they are. Sometimes the names given are their real names. Sometimes it's a craft name used to protect the practitioner. As I mentioned earlier, there's a real cost to pagans and their families when their faith is made public. At this time, I wanna to talk to you about the cost of being pagan and being out of the broom closet. We're constantly misrepresented in the media. Um, as you can see by the photos that I shared earlier, while we know that those photos are fictional, sometimes people assume that our religion isn't real or that we're evil or that what they've seen on TV and in movies must be real. The pagans, witches, and heathens I've interviewed have all shared stories describing how they've been impacted by these prejudices. And I'm, so <laughs> in 1999, in response to a statement by Representative Bob Barr, who was a Republican from Georgia, regarding Wiccan gatherings on military bases, the Free Congress Foundation called for US citizens to not enlist or to re-enlist, to not re-enlist in the US Army until the Army terminated the on-base freedoms of religion, speech, and assembly for all Wiccan soldiers. Though this movement died a quiet death, thankfully, on June 24th, 1999, then Governor George W. Bush stated that he was opposed to Wiccan soldiers practicing their faith on Fort Hood, Texas. On Good Morning America, he stated, I don't think witchcraft is a religion and I wish the military would take another look at this and decide against it. The good news is that pagans, witches, and Wiccans did, did eventually win, but but we didn't win the right to have a pentagram placed on our headstones in military cemeteries until April 23rd, 2007. And remember what I said, that Wicca and paganism has been listed in the US Army Chaplain's book since the 80s. Um, in 2010, <laughs> Christine O'Donnell, who was a Republican candidate for Senate from Delaware, got caught in a firestorm of controversy when reports had been released that she had practiced witchcraft and had admitted it on a television program. In response, she created a commercial in which she asserted, I'm not a witch, I'm you. Um, I do have a link to it. For some reason, my YouTube is not working. So I'm going to link it. And actually, I can't link it. Fun, there it is, okay. I'm gonna put it in the chat there so that you guys can see it in a second. There it is. Um, under normal circumstances, I play this video, but it, the sound isn't working so that I can play it. So you guys will be able to link to it on your own time. Um, it, <laughs> In response, she created this commercial, which she said, I'm a witch, I'm, I'm not a witch, I'm you. When this happened, many of us wondered, I am a witch, how are you gonna represent me? In response, witches, pagans, and heathens all over the country made videos exclaiming, I am a witch, and this is what's important to me, and we sent them to Ms. O'Donnell. Um, there are other stories, hey, come back here. There are other stories. Um, of witchcraft in the headlines. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, so I'm not gonna go through all of them. Um, our news media doesn't even get it right sometimes. Um, in February 17th, 2013 on Fox News, the Fox and Friends weekend commentators, Anna Kuman, Clayton Morris, Tucker Carlson, 
and Tammy Bruce spent part of their Sunday morning mocking Wicca and the practitioners of witchcraft in regards to a listing of pagan and Wiccan holidays listed in the University of Missouri's Guide to Religion. Um, at one point, uh, <laughs> Tucker Carlson said it's not real anyway. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to remember the whole quote, but he said he believed that witches were basically people who spent too much time on their computer and had too many cats. And again, I have the link. I can link it in the, in the uh, thing later. Um, again, we're running out of time. So I want to tell you some real stories. Um, get to our pictures because I know we only have five minutes left. Come on. Okay, this is my friend Jen. Uh, when she was president of Reading Pagans and Witches, um, we had a celebrating Earth Spirituality Festival for Autumn Equinox. The community was invited on the event page. They said we're coming together for education, merriment, and shopping. Please help us put our best foot forward as a community. Treat everyone as a friend. Protesters showed up, parts of the village were shut down in protest. The story about the festival and the protest went international and her life was turned upside down. Friends that she's known since kindergarten asked, why would I wanna be friends with a Satanist? Her husband's family disowned her. After his mother passed away, his oldest sister and his mother's sister disowned them. Um, to this day, they still do not talk to them. Um, she's been harassed at work. She's been ridiculed by coworkers, and at one point, one le woman's level of harassment actually reached a level where she was fired. Um, her son, not Jen, was fired. The other woman was fired, um, thankfully. Her son, Drake, has lost friends as well. Um, at one point, he was wearing a pentagram necklace, and when a family whose kids he was playing with saw it, they said he was evil, like they told him as a five-year-old child that he was evil and not allowed to play with their children anymore. Um, my friend, oh, there's my friend Janelle. Um, and, and part of the reason you're seeing these pic pictures is because I want you to see that pagans and witches and people like us are literally just like you. That's my baby, by the way. Um, it's our friend Emily. Gypsy from Oklahoma, Jan and her family from Tennessee, uh, my friend Kelly, things that non-pagans say that annoy me, you can't be a minister because you're pagan, you can't have a real church because you're pagan, that's not Jesus talking to you, that's the devil. <laughs> there are some of our friends at a masquerade ball, another friend, okay, I see that. Um, my friend Chris, our friend Nate, preparing for ritual. Peace. This is Shailene during her hand fasting. And I'm so sorry we're running out of time, guys. I told you I had a ton of information. Um, Tracy and Eric, Michelle, and I'm just going through these. Um, let's see, Shawnee and her story is really long. We don't have time for it. Um, Wade, that's one of my sons. And this is me, actually. And I'll very quickly tell you my story. And that is that I decided to tell one of my neighbors and close friends that I was a witch many years ago. I'd known her for several years. Our kids were friends. We, they'd slept at each other's houses many times. Um, and when I told her I was a witch, she asked me if I ate babies. Really, she asked me if I ate babies, even though she knew me well, that's the idea of witches that were stuck in her head. Um, and she couldn't divorce that thought from who I was. Thankfully, when I explained who we were and what we really did, she was open and willing to listen and we're still friends, but that's kind of the ideas that get stuck in people's heads. So I wanted to give you time for questions, but we ran out of time, um, but I do have my contact information here. Um, and you can contact me if you have any questions. I just want to follow up by telling you that I am a witch and I'm you. I'm a social worker. I'm a minister. I'm a mom. Um, the most important message all of us would like you to hear today is that we're real people. 
the stories that you've heard, the myths and the legends, that's not who we are. We're witches and heathens and Wiccans, and we really are just like you. And my contact information is right here. Again, my name is Rebecca Solia. There's my email address. It's becatha72 at gmail.com. My phone number is there. You can call me, text me, um, email me, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for attending, and I'm so sorry we ran out of time. Rachel, are you there? Thank you so much, Becky. Yes, I am, <laughs> for that wonderful okay. presentation. Thank you to our members for attending. Um, the link to the evaluation has been posted in the chat section and will remain up for a few minutes. A reminder, after you submit your evaluation and if you attended the required 50 minutes, you will receive the CE certificate via email within a few days. If you, are, if you do not see that in the chat section, I sent out an email to all of you guys that registered and it has the link as well. Um, thank you guys so much and um, we'll see you next month. And, and Rachel, was this recorded so that people can watch yes. it later if they needed to? Yes, I'll post it on the website. Awesome, awesome. So if you have somebody that you think needs to see this, they can still check it out? Yep. Awesome. Um, also, I'm available to give the full version of this, which runs like two hours. Um, if you have an organization that you think needs to see it, um, you can contact me and I'm happy to travel pretty much all over the state to give this presentation if you know somebody that needs to hear it. That's, that's all. Thank you. There it is. <laughs> Rachel, anything else? Nope, that's it. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you, everybody, and happy selling. Bye. I'm going to close the webcam somehow. There we go. All right. Thanks, Becky. You're welcome. Oh, goodness. Do you think it went okay? Um, we're still recording and there's still people here. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'll well, that's okay. Later, if okay? anybody, <laughs> yeah, I'll talk to you later. If anybody's looking for contact information, it's still there. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.